Autumn in Atlanta. A time for picnics, fun, and games. A time to head for Atlanta Stadium to watch the Falcons face the NFL's finest team. In 1974's opening game, the doomsday Dallas Cowboys started Atlanta's season on an ominous note. And it seemed as though the Falcons never really recovered from a truly disastrous game number one. For the Atlanta Falcons and their fans, the anticipation and promise of early autumn quickly faded with the chill winds of an early winter. The 9-5 record of the previous season became ancient history, as game after game, all the key plays seemed to bounce the wrong way for the Falcons. After the opening disaster against Dallas and close losses to San Francisco and New Orleans, Atlanta faced the New York Giants in week four. And for a while, it looked as though the brakes would continue to bounce away from the Falcons. But then the Giants tried two successive sideline patterns against Atlanta's strong safety, Ray Brown, number 34. Ray Brown's 59-yard touchdown gave the Falcons their first victory. And then to Atlanta came the red-hot Chicago Bears. In their fourth consecutive closely contested game, the key factor was again the strong play of strong safety Ray Brown, who came up with two more vital interceptions, one of which stopped a touchdown, while another set up a touchdown. Still, the outcome was not decided until the game's final second. After two straight close wins, came two more close losses. First, New Orleans could score only one touchdown, but it was enough to decide an otherwise dead-even battle of field goals. And then the following Monday night, the Falcons traveled to Pittsburgh, and it was then and there that the awesome Steelers first decided to play like world champions. After six consecutive close games, the season began to come apart at the seams in Miami where the reigning world champion Dolphins put it to the Falcons 42 to seven. And then the powerful Rams added insult to injury with a 21 to nothing victory in Los Angeles. Back home against the Baltimore Colts, the Falcons found that sometimes even extra effort can result in disaster. In the rematches with the two coast teams, Atlanta's once hopeful season hit bottom, as first the 49ers and then the Rams unmercifully poured it on by a combined score of 57 to seven. And with their loss to the Rams, the Falcons learned that losing can be an extremely lonely business. Quilkin was given his first pro start in the season's next to last week in Minnesota. And although he completed 11 passes, it was another dark day for the Falcons. There were nine Atlanta penalties, severe pressure from the NFC champion Vikings, and other accumulating frustrations as another close game got away from the Falcons.
After 13 long weeks of the NFL season, the Falcons had lost 11 times, the last eight in succession. And it was hard to believe that there was still one more game remaining to be played. Back home in Atlanta, on another gloomy looking day, the Falcon defense played every play as if it were the last play of their lives. While the offense did just enough, despite deplorable playing conditions, and the Falcons defeated the Green Bay Packers, a small consolation at the conclusion of a dismal season. New head coach Marion Campbell is one of the most respected men in the game. Thank you very kindly, Pat. I want to say again that it's a big honor for me to become the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. The 1975 season will be the 10th season for the Atlanta Falcons, and how well I remember the first one way back in 1966. First choice, first round, our newest member, the Atlanta Falcons. Atlanta selects Tommy Nobus, linebacker, University of Texas. A decade ago, in 1966, Tommy Nobis, the top draft choice in the country, was voted NFL Rookie of the Year. Other stars of that first season included Ernie Wheelwright, number 30, the big fullback with the breakaway speed. Wheelwright's running mate in the first Atlanta backfield was another tough runner, Junior Coffey, number 34. Atlanta's first official NFL game was against the Los Angeles Rams. The Falcons' first touchdown came on a 53-yard pass play from Randy Johnson to wide receiver Gary Barnes. Another first for Atlanta came in Yankee Stadium. On November 30th, 1966, Ex-New York Giant fullback Ernie Wheelwright caught two touchdown passes against his former teammates. And the Falcons outscored the Giants 27 to 16 for their first official NFL victory. Two weeks later came victory number two. Atlanta defeated Minnesota 20 to 13 and then returned home to face the St. Louis Cardinals the following week. The Falcons beat St. Louis 16 to 10 for their first victory in Atlanta Stadium and their third overall in a memorable first season of play in the NFL just a decade ago. My first full season as head coach at Atlanta Falcons began very much as the 1966 season began, in that I had in the 1975 college draft the very first pick in the country. The 40th annual National Football League selection meeting is now in session. First choice, first round, Atlanta Falcons, the choice acquired from Baltimore on the basis of previous trades. Atlanta Falcons first up. Atlanta Falcons select Steve Bartkowski, quarterback, University of California. Steve Bartkowski will be available for interviews in about two minutes in the room where you had Pull him to you a little bit. He's little. Pull him to you. Get closer, closer. A little closer. closer. Well, when I found out I was going to be the number one pick of the Atlanta Falcons, uh, it was just one of uh, overall excitement, uh, just uh, kind of a total exploding of emotion for me. Yeah, it was uh, kind of like a dream come true. I'm impressed by the city of Atlanta. I'm impressed by the attitude of the coaches down there. And uh, I, I think I'm going to have a, a, a successful professional career down there. <laughs> now hold it up. Show me your name, Yeah. <laughs> you didn't know how long I'm there? If Steve Bartkowski looks half as good in Falcon Red as he did in California Blue, Atlanta fans will be more than happy. Steve 
Bartkowski, 6 feet 4, 215 pounds, led the nation in passing in his senior year with more than 2,500 yards and only seven interceptions in 325 attempts. Whether throwing the bomb or the screen, Bartkowski had a golden touch with the Golden Bears. As the Pro Scouts have said, great size, great arm, great future. We're looking forward to working with Steve Bartkowski. We feel that Steve has all the tools that it takes to become a great quarterback in the National Football League. In spite of the fact that we didn't score last season as much as we anticipated, we do feel that we have a nucleus for a fine offensive football team. The Falcons began the 1974 season with two returning quarterbacks, number seven, Pat Sullivan, and number 19, Bob Lee. But it seemed that no matter which one started during the regular season, the Falcon offense could not regain the full force of its preseason striking power. Bob Lee opened the season as the incumbent starter, and it was Lee who was at quarterback in the consecutive victories over New York and Chicago. Pat Sullivan followed Lee at quarterback when the offense couldn't get rolling. But Sullivan's success was limited to short bursts, such as this touchdown to the promising rookie running back Vince Kendrick, number 20. Tim McQuilkin, the rookie from Lehigh, started only the final two games of the season in which the Falcons lost to Minnesota and then defeated Green Bay. But as Coach Campbell has said, there is no doubt in my mind and the minds of our coaches that Kim McQuilkin is going to be an outstanding NFL quarterback for the Falcons. Atlanta's three quarterbacks were victimized by no less than 50 sacks and 55 turnovers. But when there was time to throw, there were some bright moments too, such as in Pittsburgh, where all three starting receivers came up with super play. Tight end Jim Mitchell's all-out catch was one of the year's best, but both wide receivers scored on catches that were almost as spectacular. Al Dodd hung on at the left side of the end zone, and then at the back of the end zone, Ken Burrow somehow managed to catch the ball while being pushed out of bounds. Ken Burrow, with 34 receptions, led the Falcon receiving core for the season. Center Jeff Van Note made the Pro Bowl in his sixth year. And in the future, he'll be getting help on the line from trades made with Denver and Philadelphia for Laren Jackson and Steve Smith. These are the men who will open the way for young runners like Haskell Stanback, number 24, the rookie from Tennessee, who averaged better than four yards per carry. Another young slasher who will be trying to break into the lineup this year will be Woody Thompson, number 48, a six foot one inch, 219 pounder from Miami. And of course, there will again be number 43, Dave Hampton, the man who twice came within crawling distance of 1,000 yards and who again led the Falcons in rushing despite early season injuries which kept him from a third straight shot at the elusive 1,000-yard club. I feel that the specialty teams may win or lose 20 to 25% of the games played in the National Football League. 
In this category, we feel that we have some fine talent to work with. Under the new rules, it is essential to have a kicker who can kick long and a kicker who can kick accurately. In Nick Mickemeyer, the Falcons have both. It is almost as important to have the big but agile men who can block the opponent's kick. And under the new rules, the punter plays a larger role than ever. John James punted 96 times and remained one of the league's best at both distance and the ability to place the ball where he wanted it. The run back men are also more important than ever. And number 34, multi-talented Ray Brown, was again one of the league's best. <music> Gerald Tinker, number 81, added another element, the dazzling speed of an Olympic gold medalist. Now from the Buffalo Bills comes another turf burner, Wallace Francis, number 89. And now to my specialty, which is the defense. I feel that the defense performed well last year. And when you consider the fact that we had to play a little bit longer than you normally have to play due to turnovers against us, we feel that they did a fine job. With the talent that we have, we feel that we will continue to be a fine defensive football team. After his arrival as Falcon defensive coach in 1969, Marion Campbell steadily rebuilt the Atlanta defense until it became one of the NFL's best, which it has been for the past several seasons. All 11 men of the Atlanta defense work together, every man helping every other man, with the ultimate goal of stopping the opposition any way they can. The one part of the Atlanta defense which has been together longer than any other part is the linebacking core. And to add some youth to this group, Coach Campbell on the second round of the college draft chose number 55, Ralph Ortega of Florida. Atlanta's linebackers always seem to have a nose for the ball as demonstrated by left linebacker Don Hansen, number 58, in the victory over the Giants. Number 50, right linebacker Greg Brezina, also has a history of making the big play. Number 60, Tommy Novus has made a lot of tackles since he was Rookie of the Year in 1966. In 1974, Novus made 129 unassisted tackles, an amazing total, even for one of the game's best middle linebackers. The Falcons again led the conference in pass defense, allowing a completion rate of only 45%. A new addition to the secondary was second-year left cornerback Roland Lawrence, number 22. While the free safety position was contested between Ray Easterling and Clarence Ellis, number 29. Always a threat to break any game open was right cornerback Tom Hayes, number 27. But the big man in the secondary was the six foot two inch, 200 pound strong safety, number 34, Ray Brown. At times, Ray Brown played more like a linebacker than a defensive back, but at all times, he played like an all pro. Brown also led the conference in interceptions with eight a new Atlanta club record, and it seemed as though every one of them either led to a score or saved one. Yeah. 
As a former NFL defensive lineman, Marion Campbell takes special pride in his front four, featuring tackles with the size and quickness of Mike Tilleman, number 74, the experience of veteran Chuck Walker, and the strength of number 69, Mike Lewis. Number 71, John Zook has spent six seasons at right defensive end for Atlanta, but his sixth season was one of his very best. In particular, John Zook was a major factor in the close victory over the Chicago Bears. Last, but certainly not least, we have number 87, left defensive end Claude Humphrey, who continued to drive the opposition crazy with 16 sacks of the quarterback on the way to his fourth consecutive selection as a consensus All-Pro. As usual, he made life particularly difficult for the San Francisco 49ers. As great as Humphrey was against San Francisco, he had his best day down the coast in Los Angeles. It seemed that no matter what the Rams tried, number 87 was waiting for it in the Los Angeles backfield. Number 87, Claude Humphrey, six feet, five inches, 265 pounds of super football player. And one of the principal reasons for the National Conference victory in the Pro Bowl game at Miami, where Humphrey played both left and right end for the blue-shirted NFC. Led by Claude Humphrey, John Zook, Ray Brown, Tommy Novus, and Coach Marion Campbell, it is no wonder that the Atlanta defense is one of the best in the entire NFL. This is Farman University, our summer camp. This is where we hope to put it all together. With the trades that we've just recently made and with the draft that we've completed for the coming season, we expect to, number one, become competitive by position. Hopefully, this will carry over versus our common opponents. I am looking forward to giving us a fresh start for the coming season. From myself, the staff, the Falcon organization, and the players themselves, I can promise you one thing, and that's a lot of hard work to give our fans and ourselves a better football team for this season.